Well, one of the great things about the gospel of Jesus Christ and is the there are life-changing principles, life-changing principles. And we're going to talk about that. And one of the life-changing principles is if we will take our love to our loved ones and take our frustrations to the Lord, we are entitled to certain promises. And I want to talk to you about love for just a minute. What do I mean? How is this going to happen? Because I want to promise you something that's not my promise. I, the Lord God, am bound when you do what I say. And his invitation, whether it's to pay tithing, like uh, prove me now here with, or whether or not it's prove all things and hold fast to that which is true, the Lord's invitation for us is to try his way of doing it. And what's important to me is that the Savior is not only telling us what we're to do, he's telling us how we're to do it. And so he makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the light. I'm not only what you're to do, I'm how you're to do it. And if you'll do it that way, you have a promise. If you don't, you have no promise. So how can I acquire that promise? Well, it's capsulized in that statement. Take your love to your loved ones. Take your frustrations to the Lord. Now, love, we can define love as saying, maybe, maybe love means acceptance, affection, appreciation, with the intent in your heart of helping someone else become their highest and best self. Now that, I think, acceptance, affection, appreciation, and with that intent in mind, we talk about that as being loving. However, the Lord introduced something new to that. What he said was, a new commandment I give unto you, now, that we love one another as I've loved you. This is a new commandment, this is John 13, or, yeah, 13, 34. And I find it interesting because, the question, is that a new commandment? I thought way back when, the love of God, love your fellow man, uh, how can that be a new commandment? And I pondered that and studied it for quite a while and finally figured out the difference. You see, the, uh, the law of Moses is a philos. So that's a Greek word for, uh, like, Philadelphia city, brotherly love. It means to love with deep affection. But agape, which is another Greek word, which is the one used in the New Testament by Jesus, means the pure love of Christ. It means the highest form of love that there is. It's a higher form of love. So when you are given in that Leviticus 19, uh, 18, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, well, that's a law of Moses level of love that deals with deep abiding affection. <coughs> However, the new commandment was to love as Christ loved. That's a higher way to love than love your, your neighbor as you love yourself. No, I want you not to do that. I want you to love at a higher level. So this higher level requires us to leave the natural man and the natural woman behind. Because we know that the natural man and the natural woman are an enemy to God. And how, why is that? Well, it's because it's the natural uh, kind of telestial response that we give. So th this is where I'm going to get into frustration in just a minute. But the idea about loving, it's this higher form of love. That's where I'm coming from. So I'm saying we're going to take our higher form of love to our loved ones. And that's going to mean not criticizing them. It's going to be not finding fault. It means that the only time you're going to be justified to share your criticism or fault finder or, or your disappointments or whatever will be, according to section 121, 396 words in verse 34 to 46. 396 words. And those are incredibly powerful words. Reprove and be timely sharp as when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Well, I've been moved upon by frustration. I've been moved upon by disappointment. I've been moved upon, I think, by anger. All right? But in terms of actually being moved upon by the Holy Ghost, that is rare in my lifetime. I've had that happen a few times as a bishop, where I felt, and let me tell you something about it, uh, those times. I was in total control, no yelling, no screaming, no tears, no glassy eye frothing at the mouth, all right? In other words, in total control, truly with the other person's best interest in mind, and able to express it in that way. Now. Even if I felt that way and had emotional control, according to that scripture, I'm not allowed, unless I get a revelation and inspiration that's truly coming from the Lord and not from my own frustration, all right? And if I will do that, then I can bind the Lord to a promise. But it's not easy to do because we are in the habit. See, the tragedy is that we tend to express our frustration when we're upset and unhappy. And so guess what message comes across? Acceptance, affection, appreciation? No, no. The message we send is one of non-acceptance and rejection and inadequacy in, the, in, our, in our words. 
And then we've got all this emotional blood we have to clean up afterwards. Before, because the focus of whatever our comment was, whatever that comment was that we made, that we really felt they needed to know, whatever that comment was, is going to be interpreted as an attack on their self-worth. It's not going to be interpreted as, oh, you're really looking after my eternal best interest. Now, in 44 years of counseling, I've got to tell you something. I've never yet found one adult child or one adult that did not know what their parent values were. And, or lack knowledge of right from wrong. All right? And so because of that, we tend to want to tell somebody something they already know. And so when you share with somebody something they already know, and it's negative, you're going to alienate them. And pretty soon they're not going to see you anymore. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You may think, oh, well, but I only have their best interest at heart. I, they should know that I love them. I mean, that's why I'm sharing this with them. That's not going to be the message. It's going to be a message of rejection, and they're going to want to avoid you. All right?